Okay, so that's the basics of how these Keynesian models of growth work, right? Is that because output is determined by demand or by income, okay, then the growth of output must be due to the growth of demand and the growth of demand is due to the growth of investment. Yeah, that's what we saw in the last slide. Now, two particular models in this Keynesian tradition were done by these two economists, Herod, Roy Herod, who I talked about before, and F.C. Domar. And the literature started referring to this as the Herod-Domar model. Now, the reality is that, you know, the two models were kind of different. I mean, the conclusions they came to, for example, were different. The way they approached the model was different, but they did have some similarities. Okay, so um, in one case, they both used this Keynesian model of growth, so where the growth of output is due to the growth of demand, and the growth of demand comes from the growth of investment. And one other thing which I'll talk about on the next slide. Now, before I do though, these are the two articles, so you'll see that this is, you know, um, World War II era, you know, 1939 was the first one by Roy Herod in the Economic Journal, and then F.C. Domar uh, in 1946. Here's the other thing that linked these two models. So first was they had this Keynesian view of what causes the growth in output, okay? And the other is they both noticed that investment then has this dual nature, okay? So first, what we already talked about is investment increases income, okay? So changes in investment or growth in investment is what leads to growth in income and output and also employment. However, notice that it also provides the capital necessary for employing workers or for creating that output, right? It has these two natures. It's both increasing aggregate demand and it's also increasing productive capacity by increasing the amount of machines or, you know, the amount of factories or whatever are needed to produce this output, okay? That's the dual nature of investment. Here's a quote from Domar from his 1946 article. And he says, if investment both increases productive capacity and generates income, then it provides us with both sides of the equation, the solution of which may yield the required rate of growth. Okay? So again, it's just this idea that it's doing two things, right? It's increasing demand, it's leading to growth in demand, but it's also leading to growth in productive capacity. Here's my drawing, okay? We saw this already. In this Keynesian model, we usually have that demand is somewhere less than productive capacity. And when I invest, it does two things, right? It increases aggregate demand, okay? If I increase my level of investment, it'll increase aggregate demand, and it also increases productive capacity. Now this, as it turns out, you know, this Keynesian model has two sort of shortcomings, okay? So the first one here I call problem one, and it's Herodian instability, named after Roy Herod. And in fact, Domar doesn't have this in his model. You know, everyone's attributing all these things to Herod and Domar, but in fact, this is just in the Herod model. It says, okay, imagine firms are trying to target some ratio of capital to output. Why? Because, okay, again, imagine I, I need some amount of capital to produce output, okay? And I'm trying to target that amount of capital for any given amount of output. Now imagine that that ratio, capital to output ratio, is below my target, below what I need, okay? Well then, what am I gonna do? Well, okay, I'll invest, fine, great. So, therefore, I'll increase my investment if I'm a firm. I'm trying to hit this KY ratio, if I'm below it, well then what should I do? I should increase my investment so that I increase capital and I can try to hit this target. Now, as we said, this has two effects, right? One is that it increases the growth of K, which is good, that's what I want if I'm the firm, but the other is that it increases the growth of Y, right? Because demand is a function of I, it's a function of investment. We saw this earlier. Now, the problem is, and this is what leads to the instability, is if the effect on Y is greater than the effect on K, so put another way, if it increases output more than it increases the capital stock, then this ratio might actually decrease, right? Remember, I'm trying to increase and I'm trying to hit my target, which we're currently below. But it could be that the effect on income is so great 
compared to how much it increases my capital stock, that this ratio might decrease, okay? Then what do I do? Well, I'm even further below my, my target now, even further below this KY ratio I want, so I'll increase investment even more. Well, you can see the problem here. What's that gonna do? Well, it could be the exact same thing. This might increase income even more, and I might be even further from my target in that case. And this might lead growth to just continue accelerating and accelerating, okay? And vice versa, if I'm above target, assuming kind of the same process, you can imagine this is leading growth to be slower and slower and slower, okay? This is this instability problem. And so you can see that kind of, in one case, this might lead to greater and greater inflation as I'm, you know, the demand is higher and higher than the potential supply and vice versa. This might lead to higher and higher kind of recession or depression, right? As demand is becoming or is growing slower and slower relative to supply. Here's the second problem. This one's maybe a little bit even simpler. So recall that productive capacity is really given by these three things, right? There's capital, yes, but then there's also labor supply, okay? The potential amount of workers who are available to work and Z, the level of technology. Now, investment increases K. We talked about this, that makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily increase the other two, right? So it can increase productive capacity to a point, but given that it can affect these two, eventually we might run into productive capacity problems, okay? So therefore, if the growth in aggregate demand is different than the growth rate of labor supply and technology, these two right here, and we refer to that as the natural rate of growth, then we will either have increasing unemployment or decreasing unemployment and inflationary pressure, okay? Why? Well, Maybe I'll, it's best explained actually with this next example. And, okay, so I'll explain this in the next slide, but just note right now that nothing in the Herod model guarantees that the economy will grow at this natural rate. Okay, there's nothing that says that aggregate demand needs to be growing at the rate of labor supply and technology. And given that there's nothing ensuring that, well, then we can lead to these instances where, again, unemployment is constantly falling or constantly rising. Here's my simple example to explain why, okay? Imagine that output is produced by this simple production function, okay? So I need this many, or sorry, output is just Z times the amount of labor employed, okay? Now, remember that in the Keynesian model, the amount of labor is determined by aggregate demand, okay? So in other words, aggregate demand is determined first, and then I pick the number of workers I need to hit that amount of output. So I'm just rearranging this equation for labor demand, okay? Now what's the unemployment rate? It's just labor supply minus labor demand, so that's unemployment divided by labor supply, or the total labor force. Now we can rearrange this, right? So this just becomes one minus ND over NS, and then let's replace this ND by our equation here, okay? So that's aggregate demand or the amount that's demanded in the economy, okay? Divided by Z times NS. This is kind of like our productive capacity. Here I've kind of abstracted from capital just to really make this point. So notice what happens, right? If the numerator, demand, is growing slower than the denominator, productive capacity, then unemployment increases, right? If this is growing slower than this, then this whole term is shrinking and that leads U to rise, unemployment to rise, and vice versa, right? If Y is growing faster, if demand is growing faster than is technology and labor supply, then unemployment will shrink. And remember that this unemployment times labor supply, this is the natural rate of growth, okay? This is kind of like naturally, given these two things, how much we could possibly produce. And here's a quote showing you that these post-Keynesians, uh, you know, recognize this problem. So Joan Robinson in 1956 is specifically on population growth, says, 
the recruitment of labor may run ahead or fall short of the pace of accumulation. Okay? Thus, it seems best to treat accumulation and growth in the labor force as two independent factors, which may or may not be in harmony with each other. Okay, so the growth in capital, and in particular the growth in output, need not be going at the same rate as the growth of the labor supply. And one could also include here the rate of technological progress. But the point really is this, is that the amount that demand grows doesn't necessarily have to be equal to the growth rate of the productive capacity of the economy. Okay? It might be the same, we hope, as the growth rate of capital, but it doesn't have to be the same as productive capacity in general. Now this started to be referred to as the knife edge, the knife edge solution of the Herod model. Okay? So in Herod's model, there's one rate of growth in which the economy is stable. This goes for both problems, in fact. Right? There's one kind of rate of growth where things are fine. And then if we deviate from this rate of growth, slight deviations from this rate of growth make the economy unstable. So you can think about in the second problem, the natural rate of growth. Imagine that demand is growing much faster than the natural rate of growth, i.e. the rate of growth of technology and labor supply. <clears throat> well, if that's the case, then we have you know, either increasing unemployment or decreasing unemployment. And there's nothing that's bringing these two things into equilibrium. And so this became termed the knife edge. You know, there's one small rate of growth at which things are stable. And if we deviate from that at all, then, you know, suddenly the economy becomes unstable. We either have increasing inflation or increasing unemployment. It's this knife edge growth rate. And there's nothing ensuring that we're on that growth rate. And so, we're finally getting to Solo here. This is kind of a problem for some of these people. So, for example, Solo in his 1956 article that we'll talk about soon says, were the magnitudes of key parameters, for example, the savings ratio, the capital output ratio, the rate of increase of the labor force, if they were to slip ever so slightly from dead center, you know, ever so slightly from this knife edge, then the consequence would be either growing unemployment or prolonged inflation. This is kind of what I've shown you with these two problems, right? 